Well, hello there, folks. Welcome to the Inside Line F1 podcast and Pits to Podium. And on today's episode, we review the Styrian Grand Prix. Yeah, it was a little bit of a boring one, but we answer the big questions. And what are they? Today, we discuss where did Max Verstappen end up winning the race? Of course, we speak about Mercedes and how the hunted have become the hunters. Then we bring you the stats run down by Sundaram. And of course, discussing what could have happened for Pierre Gasly and George Russell if things would have been slightly different. It's a word, it's a big word, this one, if, but we have to discuss more on that one. Then we speak about Ferrari's sublime recovery and Daniel Ricciardo having a very hard day. And at last, we answer all your questions from Instagram. All of this on this loaded episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast and Pitch to Podium. Let's begin. Hi there, folks. Welcome back here. My name is Somal Arora. You might know me from The Driving Force on Disney Plus Hotstar and from Racebot TV if you love your esports racing. I'm joined by Kunal Shah, the ex-marketing head of Force India, which I'm not supposed to say that because he still markets quite a lot, but he used to be the marketing head of Force India, (laughs) now working at a very high position at another Norwegian company, along with being the motorsport consultant for the VS Sport Network in Norway. But... Big question, Kunal. Big question on everyone's minds today is, why was Austria, no, sorry, why was Styria so boring when we just forecasted it to be the best race we could have all season long? I think we all just jinxed it, Samuel, <laughs> uh, you know, from start to end, given just high the expectations, you know, just how high the expectations were. Mm. Uh, you know, Styria said, that's it, I'll show you guys, just because <laughs> you all have had seven fantastic races this season. Let me give you a dud so you appreciate the good races when they come your way. You know, it was probably yeah. one of those things. And, you know, Samuel, I'm sure I wasn't alone when I thought that, hey, maybe Paul Ricard is a better racing circuit <laughs> than the the A1 ring or the, uh, the Red Bull ring, as we call it. Of course, guys, I'm joking before you'll pounce <laughs> onto us uh, and, and put it that way. But, Samuel, I think, you know, a couple of reasons why we probably had a slightly okay-ish boring, not so fun race, I would say. Uh, Clearly, the writing is on the wall. You know, Red Bull Racing is the faster car, is the faster package. Uh, Their advantage is just a couple of tenths, you know, but those couple of tenths is what actually cost us an entertaining race in, in Austria, I would say. So that was one. We'll dig into that a little deeper. And then I, I also believe the hotter tire temperatures, right, or hotter mm-hmm. track temperatures sort of didn't really aid to good racing as well. And then maybe I'm just going to also blame the rain gods. You know, all the warnings <laughs> of 40% chance of rain uh, also mean that 60% of chance of no rain sawmill. And that's what we got eventually. No rain in the end. But there's also one major factor that we have to watch out for. There's a bit of a serious one. I know I'm changing the mood right here. But aero wash. Uh, that's what they say on the oval side. At least dirty air for that matter. It's a good advocate for the 2022 Formula 1 cars, this one. There's only one on board you have to see for that one. Uh, Was it? No, I think it was Sebastian Vettel when he was passing Landon Norris later on. You just had to see how violently Norris' car shook up later on. That's the effect of the dirty air. That is how hard following can be, which is why I mean, eventually you kind of end up seeing all the cars staying back. I mean, what's the incentive? That's not Lando Norris, by the way, I just realized. It was Charles Leclerc. But you get the idea. The dirty air is big. It's major. And come to think of it, Kunal, next year might just see less of these races. It's not going to be dramatically different, but we are going to see those slight improvements. But that's still, that's still a minor improvement for next year, of course. We are all living with a lot of hopes, Samuel. You know, it, it was supposed to be 2021 when our hopes were, you know, our prayers were going to be answered. Uh, but it's now going to be 22 with the new regulations. But that said, I mean, you know, uh, our prayers of having an entertaining season are also being answered this yeah. this uh, season in 2021. But yes, you're right. You know, uh, Daniel Ricardo complained of dirty air. Yuki Sonoda complained of dirty air. We saw the we saw the epic on board that you're talking about and yes you know it's it's always been a case of dirty air that's sort of cost us some really fantastic wheel-to-wheel battles in in this era Samuel. 
There is that. And before we move on to the bigger questions that we have to answer, let's ask ourselves a small question right here. A manscaped lawnmower moment of the weekend. Uh, I think there were very few this time out, Kunal. But who would you end up picking? For me, it has to be Leclerc's off track at the first lap, which eventually ended up into something very big. But still, what was your manscaped lawnmower moment of the weekend? You know, it, well, it, it has to be Charles Leclerc, and I think he wins it twice. Okay, mm. very strange. I mean, he of course won the driver of the day, but he ruined the races of a lot of drivers. True. I think it was you know at at the start it was Pierre Gasly, there was Antonio Giovinazzi, there was Nicolas Latifi. Unfortunately, not a lot of people are invested in Giovinazzi and Latifi's careers, <laughs> right? So we nobody yeah. made too much of you and cry about it. And then I think uh, at another point it was what Kimi Raikkonen or somebody who who's uh, who also had had an issue with Charles's front wing, or, yeah, or somebody right. drove over Charles's front wing. Or I, I can't remember, but I know that he had two moments that we would classify as the manscaped lawnmower moment. Sawil. But that said, you know, driver of the day for ruining a lot of people's races, and then of course still climbing his way back to the points. Well, we shall speak about him in more depth, but here you see on your screen, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, I'll tell you what it is. You can get a 20% discount plus free shipping on all of Manscaped's products all over the world. That right there by using the code TRIMINSIDE at checkout. Check out the link in description for more on that. Well, that's the Manscaped lawnmower moment of the day. Now, to the serious question, the big one thing that we have to discuss right here about Max Verstappen and it's a very good point that Martin Brundle brought up on the Sky TV coverage today Kunal and now I'm not often the biggest fan of it but he said that there's only nine corners at this circuit four really major ones over the course of 71 laps how on earth have Verstappen and Hamilton ended up making up such a huge gap firstly to Perez and, uh, Perez and Bottas and secondly how did Verstappen getting ended up getting such a big gap on Hamilton, who seemingly was not too bad today on the whole sense? I mean, you know, a P2 is definitely not bad, especially if you aren't in the fastest car on the grid, right? Technically, you could have been P3 if it was Verstappen and Perez both flying in, then in, in formation of one and two. But yes, you know, Max Verstappen, by, by virtue of the gap, it's definitely his most dominant win in formula one he loves the red bull ring and in fact it's uh, the only circuit where he has three wins uh, you know across the years and i think some it was after a point just a case of mercedes and hamilton realizing that that's it we'd rather settle for second save all your wares for another day and and take it from there and that's that's to the gap that he had to lewis which i think was you know over half a half a minute right and then the gap to Botas and Perez just goes to show that within the top two teams, the top drivers are another league of their own in pretty much every race of the season. And uh, great recovery from Valtteri to go from P5 to P3 and so on. But incredible pace overall. I think they lapped everyone till, you know, P5 or P6, yeah. wasn't it? And yeah. and uh, I think I think that was pretty phenomenal, Sommel. But what it makes me wonder about quite a fair bit, Kunal, is this whole perspective, right? Where Lewis Hamilton came out at the end of the race and said openly up uh, at the post-race interview that we need some sort of upgrades. We need some sort of parts coming in. Now, critically, Mercedes and Toto Wolff had an interview after that. Toto Wolff said that we have already, I mean, we, we discussed this in a previous episode. I think it was the live session with Deepak Ravagov about when do teams start to shift their focus onto next season. Mercedes say that they've done that. Mercedes say that it's already done. And they may not be bringing in any major updates. So I know I'm sensationalizing it a little bit, but have they sort of thrown in the towel? And in the long term, if they have, just, just slightly might be a more beneficial option if Red Bull continue to push on with new upgrades for 2021. You know, you've asked a question which makes me want to speak for the next 30 minutes. Go for it. Right? Go okay. for it. Everyone loves but to listen to you. I, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, can Mercedes bounce back? I think, yes, they can. 
Uh, I also believe that yes, Mercedes has shifted you know energies to the 2022 car, uh, much like every other team has. Uh, but I, I, I get this feeling Mercedes is playing psychological games and political games with Red Bull Racing. The psychological game here is you know, uh, hey, we've already started developing the 2022 car, and Red Bull is bringing upgrades to every you know uh, every race this season. So. Maybe we are spending time on 22 more and Red Bull is spending time on 21 more. You know, that's the psychological advantage that, not advantage, but they're trying to create that whole mystery. And nothing's to say that Red Bull's not, you know, spending energies on 2022 as well. You know, both teams very smartly run, very smartly managed. I'm sure they know what they're doing. And uh, my mind goes back to 2013, where Red Bull kept developing in, in that era while all the other teams, Mercedes included, you know, sort of started developing for the hybrid turbo era much before. Again, that just goes to show it is still possible that something like this could happen next season. But, you know, what there are no guarantees next year. So you'd rather take what you have this year. So it's a very interesting conundrum. But I, I do believe... Red Bull are doing the right thing by trying to go all out and get this title win. They have waited long enough. You know, Max Verstappen has waited extremely long enough for this to happen. Let's remember he actually wanted to become the youngest ever world champion, but that's you know definitely not going to happen now, right? Mm -hmm. So that's to do with the whole Red Bull 2022 Mercedes conversation, and you know it's it's like this that that's the psychological warfare and. We also saw this week that there is the political warfare that's happened mm -hmm. because Red Bull seems so quick in all conditions, at all tracks, on all tire compounds with both their drivers, okay, that Mercedes has said, okay, flexi wings, let's go and ban them. So that happened. Then, you know, after the Baku blowouts, the tire pressure corrections came in. And now, uh, you know, we've sort of got... Uh, We've got the new pit stop directive where, you know, they're trying to slow down pit stops. So literally everything that Red Bull is good at and fast at, they're trying to, you know, there's a there's this attempt to slow them down. And we can say that it is on the competitive side of things. You know, it's it's a million dollar competition that they're all in. And, you know, funnily enough, and I tweeted this just before we recorded, even Max Verstappen's post-race burnouts are not yeah. going to, the celebration he had, they are not going to be allowed as well. So they are trying to stop Red Bull racing in everything they do. But the beauty of this sommel is that the package of Red Bull, at least at the moment, is so strong that Red Bull is able to literally take these changes in and still come out on top. And that's my monologue. <laughs> A lovely monologue, that one. Bef two things before we go on to Sundaram's stats review. That is an amazing section coming up. Stick around for that. Two things. Firstly, uh, can they have a technical directive to ban chopping and changing of young drivers so quickly? Because if that's one thing that can <laughs> sort of try and slow Red Bull down, please do that. I don't want to see so many careers go into the bin so quickly. Prematurely brought up, prematurely sent down again. Hindsight, that is. You can't quite tell in that moment. But the second thing, Gunal, we can answer this very briefly. And it's a question that you brought up. It's a question you raised. And it's a lovely one, this. Are they the strongest package right now, Red Bull and Verstappen as a team together. Because Sergio Perez seemingly can't quite just make it work. I mean, we were singing his praises a couple of weeks ago, but today, eh, you get a feeling that there could have been more. Well, you know, uh, frankly, Checo Perez would have been P3 or at least a higher chance of P3 had the Red Bull uh, pit stop error not uh, happened. You know, that said, uh, so... To me, Red Bull are definitely the quickest package. Yes, at the hands of Max Verstappen, that's the that's the that's the quality of that combination as as we see it. And uh, you know, Lewis Hamilton kept saying all weekend after qualifying, you know, uh, that they have two tenths extra on us. It's on the straights. We don't have those two tenths in our package. You know, Valtteri and I are driving the wheels of our car. We don't have more grip, and that's just. That just goes to show that at the moment, Red Bull have sort of nudged ahead. And let's remember, Samuel, till 
couple of races ago, maybe till till Spain, it was still very very close, you know. And mm. to me, the the fine margins are not fine anymore. I think they've widened a little bit, little bit enough for you know Red Bull to have a bit of comfort, but also a little bit enough for races to get a tad bit boring if you know Max keeps doing sure. what he's doing. And and Samuel, how soon do you think before we all ask the question? Is the Max Verstappen Red Bull racing dominance boring Formula One fans? I think many people ask that today as well. Uh, people get <laughs> a bit too sensational, a bit too quickly. There's that. But let's watch. Let's wait and watch. And, and you sure do know how to plant a seed of doubt in your mind, Kunal. Because 2022, again, you mentioned that reference back to 2013. We all know how that fathomed out eventually. Ah, too much excitement stuff. Too much exciting stuff. It's so exciting, I can't get my grammar right today. That's awesome. But you know what it's time for? <laughs> it's time for stats, some stats here. And let's go for the stats review by Sundarup coming up right here. And watch out for this one because some really kick-ass stats are coming up right now. Thank you, Somal. Well, after the Spanish Grand Prix where we saw Mercedes pulling off a brilliant strategy, once again, we began to think that this is going to be end of the season where Mercedes can pull themselves out of any difficult situation. But fast forward four races later and Mercedes are really struggling from all aspects, be it strategy or even be it pace. They are genuinely struggling and the Red Bull dominance for once seems genuine. It's not just something that's happened at the street circuits. It's also happened at the more traditional circuits right now. And Talking about the last four races that we've had, so there is Austria, there is France, Azerbaijan and Monaco. These are circuits where Mercedes generally tend to do quite well. Not talking about Lewis Hamilton uh, individually, this is Mercedes as a team. So there's Nico Rosberg, Valtteri Bottas uh, and Lewis Hamilton's results collectively. They, take, they, they tend to take a lot of wins and podiums at these four circuits. But Red Bull taking four wins on the trot over here goes to show that they're saying, hey, we are not, we are not going to let this, this one easy for you guys and we are going to fight right till the end. So looking at Red Bull's performance in the last four races, it's not very surprising if I say that Max Verstappen has taken back-to-back -back wins for the first time in his career. And Mercedes, uh, and this is a very much publicized stat already, and Mercedes, Mercedes uh, have their longest winless, winless streak in the hybrid era, four races, uh, and we don't know when that streak is going to end. When are they going to be on the top step of the podium once again? And similarly, along those lines, once again, this is the first time that a Mercedes-powered car has not led a lap at Austria since 2002. So that once again shows that they have they really prefer this track and they've had uh, some good results over here. And a very interesting stat that we also have this time is that this is the first time the FP1 table topper has won a race in 2021. There's a bit of a jinx going on. Whoever led FP1 was not going to win uh, the race. And uh, quite a few fans on social media were a bit worried that Max Verstappen is probably going to lose this one. But turns out that's not the case. And he's he's won it. Uh, another, I think the most painful moment of uh, this race was seeing George Russell retire. I think he was P8 at, at that time, P8 or P9. And it's, it's the third time that he's actually had to retire from a race uh, where he had the chance to collect some points for Williams. So there was Imola 2020, Imola 2021, and uh, Austria in 2021. So uh, another retirement, another mechanical retirement, but his first mechanical retirement since last year's season opener, once again in Austria. Fingers crossed he gets to break that little... Uh, speak that he's on of not scoring points for Williams. And the last stat that we have for today is about Charles Leclerc. Now, today's driver of the day has a very interesting uh, connection that he has, that Charles Leclerc has with Austria and current or former Red Bull drivers. So he always tends to bang wheels with them. He always tends to come in contact with them at this particular circuit. So in 2019, it was Max Verstappen uh, towards the last few, in, in the last few laps. Uh, in 2020, he wiped away Sebastian Vettel's rear wing, uh, another former Red Bull driver. And today it was unfortunately Pierre Gasly uh, who was at the receiving end. So I think Sergio Perez has to be a little bit careful of a scarlet red car in next year's Austrian Grand Prix. Uh, but yeah, that's that. So this was a mini stats review of the Styrian Grand Prix. Uh, do watch out for this full stats rundown article, which will go up on the website uh, very, very soon. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. 
Did you hear that? Did you really hear that? The first time a Mercedes car has not led a lap at Austria since 2002. How does he do that? I don't know. Do you know how he does that, Kunal? Seriously, that, that, he, he's just on another level. He is. I don't know how he does it. I don't want to know how he does it. I'm just <laughs> glad he's on our team. And, you know, I'm just so glad we are able to bring such a diverse set of stats with uh, with the effort that Sundaram puts in and, you know, with the lens that he sees the sport with. And, yeah. guys, he's been doing this for years now and we are thrilled that he's bringing it to us on our show as well. 100%. With that, let's speak about our next topic. Well, feels weird. I haven't done an introduction to any topic like that. Feels like the most basic host thing to do. But here we are today. Bottas and Russell. Now, bit of a weird race. It gets us thinking about what if... What if could have? What if Gasly did not have his crash? What if Russell did not have his incident? Let's start with George Russell firstly, and let's start with the performances. Now, another big question on our mind is, who performed better today? Was it Russell? Was it Bottas? Because all the way through, Bottas could not at the end got saved by the flag, is what many people called it in his battle against Perez. Whereas George Russell, uh, the heart pains for him, right? Seeing that pneumatic error take away his first points potentially here today. Who do you really think performed better here today? You know, the thing is, it's a tough answer. And I guess we are all so biased. And I'm not going to say against who or for who, because (laughs) it's pretty much written that unless you are finished, you will believe that Valtteri Bottas is holding up George's career and championship prospects in that Mercedes. That's pretty clear unless you're finished, right? Like I said, and to me, I think Valtteri drove a brilliant race. Let's remember he out-qualified Lewis Hamilton in Mm. qualifying. He had the, he had the error in the pit lane and that's why he started P5, but he still recovered and finished P3. Yes, he was, you know, far away from the leaders and so on and so forth. But that said, you know, somewhere, if we all just feel so emotionally connected when you know, George Russell puts it into Q3, starts P10, has a free choice of tires, is running high up, is fighting Fernando Alonso and the likes. And yeah. it's 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 tough to ignore the kind of performances he's now been putting in literally every Grand Prix weekend in that Williams racing car. And I believe he would have been in the running for the points as well, Sommel. And to me, uh, I think Russell's, uh, race is a good example of what Dirty Air also does, right? Mm. This is my reading. He qualified higher up. He started higher up and he was fighting in, in the point scoring finishes. And because of Dirty Air, he could also end up staying there, right? And that's what worked in his favor. It's like in, in the matrix sense of things, the balance in Russell's equation was, you know, Daniel Ricciardo. He, he, he was quick, but he was stuck lower down the order in Dirty Air again. So it was that. But that said, I, I think I would go with Russell performed better at the Stadium Grand Prix than Valtteri Bottas. Morpheus still doesn't think he's ready, though. And Bottas seemingly is here <laughs> to stay. But that battle between him and Sergio Perez, we're talking about Bottas right here, of course. Very good. He was saved by the flag, yes. But that was some good defending right down to the very end. But do I really like to see those sort of last lap... Uh, Last few laps sort of dashes for the fastest lap. I don't. It's it's sort of like a consolation prize. It's like giving the third place person in the Olympics not even a medal of bronze, a medal of tin. I mean, it's a medal for sure, but what is it? You might say, oh, one point, yeah, Brazil 2008, anything can happen, but sort of takes away the whole charm. We're trying to find something at the end of the race where it should be something a lot more exciting. Again, mini rant, not supposed to matter right now. We're supposed to focus on the Styrian Grand Prix. And that was a good battle that we saw right there. Uh, but also, Knall, a small question that's also popped up. What if, now that we're on the subjects of what if, what if Pierre Gasly did not have that crash? We can speak about this very briefly because his qualifying record has been super. Ever since Bahrain has happened, Gasly has been on the roll. But today, was it really his fault? Uh, no, I definitely don't think it was his fault. It was termed as a racing incident and he was just at the receiving end of some useful exuberance from <laughs> Charles Leclerc, I would say. And I have a feeling he would have been 
you know, uh, between maybe Norris and Sainz, given the pace of the Alpha Tauri, given the form he's in as well. And, you know, he's, he's scored points in the last six races. And, and uh, it, was, it was a pain to see that it was actually, uh, you know, Pierre Gasly who actually went out. He, he, it was funny, you know, when he drove in with three wheels on his wagon, you know, Fernando Alonso style in Baku. But yes, it was a case of missed opportunities. But that's just how competitive the midfield is. And mm. that's just how it goes sometimes when you're racing in the midfield, Solo. Yeah, barely enough space. Fernando Alonso was very good over there. His send down the inside of Charles Leclerc at turn number one. Uh, sorry, down the inside of Pierre Gasly at turn number one. That's off. That's the veteran's experience coming off. Got both positions in that case. That was a very smart one. Now, moving on. From this point to the next one, more about the midfield. Ferrari, that's what we spoke about. Leclerc made it hard for themselves, uh, for himself, I'm sorry. But later on, his recovery drive was just amazing. And he came on the radio uh, when he was speaking to Rosanna Tend at the end. And he said, I only made it harder for myself. It probably must have been my best performance ever. But I didn't enjoy it because of what happened at the start. We've spoken about the start already, Kunal. But that recovery drive... now. This is what intrigues me. Ferrari, only a week ago, we were saying that, oh, they're bad on their tyre management. They seemingly are the worst team. Here, it's their tyre management that got them a very good result. And Leclerc's just confidence on that rubber was outstanding. What was it? Two, three moves made on the outside line? At turn number three, where Alex Albon went off last year. I think, you know, Charles Leclerc, he, he, he said this was probably his best performance. And that's correct. Uh, I think uh, for the second uh, race in a row, he pitted at the end of lap one at uh, in at the Red Bull ring. And that's the strange thing, right? He's sort of making it a habit, Sommel. But his recovery to me was, was outstanding. But, you know, I must say that even Carlos Sainz Jr., he went from P12 to P6 purely on tyre strategy and race pace. So commendable recovery from Ferrari given the tire woes from literally you know six days ago uh they 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 of course said they will test out some solutions and you know their solution was literally put all the wing you possibly can <laughs> because they were the slowest on the straights of all the drivers you know both the drivers uh just about at, at just about just about 310 kilometers per hour about five or seven seconds slower than some of their key competitors so that's 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 what they did. They, they. I think, especially you know, uh, Carlos Sainz's case, he ran 47 laps on the medium tire uh, to sort of make his strategy work and jump six positions to the top. And I'm just reading the tire charts out here. He actually did more laps on the medium than he did on the hard solid. That's just how Ferrari's strategy worked. So hats off to both the drivers and to Ferrari for, you know, figuring a solution out. And let's remember, they are stuck in a battle. They, they are in the thick of a battle yeah. with uh, with McLaren for P3 in, in the Constructors' Championship. With Ferrari's solutions, it's just like ramming a triangle into a circular hole and just making it work sometimes. That's just the way it ends up being. <laughs> but it's outstanding. That that fact that you mentioned there, Kunal, about Ferrari not being the fastest on the straights, without any disrespect, if Enzo would have been alive, he would have been chasing each and every one of them at the factory with his walking <laughs> stick. He would be angry because for Enzo Ferrari, engine and top speed was everything. God bless that poor soul. What, what a man he was. But yeah, this brings us to another question again. Uh, uh, we've got... Instagram questions here today and that's a lovely thing that we're getting to do we've got five odd minutes to answer them and there are some amazing ones and yes we spoke about Daniel Ricciardo speaking of Daniel Ricciardo here is a really good one a question by I know F1 a page that we partnered up with recently to speak about DTM let's answer that one very first what do you think happened to Danny Rick what do you think happened to Danny Rick Canal? we saw him drop off he gained four positions at the start, but then somewhere in the middle, he just lost off all those four positions. Now, the broadcasters on Sky apparently said that it was something due to heating. Uh, what, what do you reckon it was? It was a power unit issue that they had to manage, uh, you know, early on in the race. And uh, basically, Danny just said that that sort of undid his whole race, all the hard work of, you know, climbing up positions. And I'm seeing the lap time charts right now. 
he actually made up a fair bit of positions and he was just behind you know george russell when when the issue struck and then he suddenly lost positions to to several i think three or four drivers that literally had to drive past him and uh, that's it and then it was dirty air that that sort of you know uh, had him in so it it was it was an unfortunate thing it was probably something to do with uh, with some mode or some software setting because the team was able to fix it uh, you know over the air as as they normally can do so which brings us on to the next one uh, we we shall get to that lonzo comment very very quickly but where is one from side the fifth how long will mclaren keep on supporting danny rick patricio award for 2022 this is interesting now award is doing a lovely job back in indy car is that that mclaren arrow sp car is an absolute beast and our beasts can be fast but beasts can be moody as well and he's just trying to fight right there i think he got a win in detroit and st petersburg he was just looking absolutely terrible because the car was looking very terrible bottom line is i don't think award is going anywhere until he wins the indy car championship he's so fixated on that he's making strong progress But I want to know your take on this canal very briefly. For how long do you think Ricciardo will be supported by McLaren? My answer as long as his contract is there, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I'm sure the team and driver are going to work as hard to bounce back because mm. I I have I have actually a couple of things to say. Let's remember they have acknowledged and when I say they I mean McLaren and Lando Norris have acknowledged that they have a car which is not very easy to drive there are some mm. unnatural things a driver needs to do to get on top of that car and what we are seeing Lando Norris do is just basically the fact that he's been so long with the team and he knows how that car works right mm. but that said i'm actually going to turn this question around on its head can you imagine how mclaren would be and what a potent force they'll be when both their drivers are firing on all cylinders and we saw that briefly in france right yeah and Daniel Ricardo has been in these situations much like every other driver every other professional athlete goes through such you know lows in their professional career and he is going to bounce back it's it's just a question of when and not if i would say and hmm. yes i agree with you samuel that they will persist till the last day of his contract or the last race on his contract I mean, they've paid the money, might as well get some use of it, right? They're banking on 2022 is the fun thing. But Award, I think he should be in F1 sometime soon. It's a major problem that IndyCar drivers are not able to migrate. That's my rant for some other day. But there's that. Another fun question by Rohit112. Alonso losing track position to Sainz due to blue flags. Unfair. <laughs> that really was unfair. Uh, Max Verstappen is coming in to lap up Carlos Sainz. <laughs> and Fernando Alonso too by the way and because of that Sainz just very sneakily got the position on on Fernando Alonso uh there were some words there were some explicatives on the team radio that came up after that was it unfair was it just Sainz just using a racing scenario to the best of his advantage i think that's what i would put it right of course i mean they they are racing car drivers for this very reason and i'll i'll again turn this around <laughs> fernando alonso would have done the same thing and then suddenly we've all we, we would have all been like ah the cheeky alonso is back this is that trait of his which which made him a two times world champion i think it's 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 in the rules it was it's it's allowed and you know carlos sainz just made a cheeky move and yeah. make made it stick he did two of them at the start as well i i know i'm babbling about too much about fernando today but he was superb all the way through just a shame the alpine wasn't fast enough but he obliterated ocon which is strange since that contract signing alonso has been on top and ocon has been nowhere <laughs> was it a bit too early to hand him a 3 year deal i don't know you tell me next up we've got a question by ravin kapoor signs should have pushed harder against norris it's not a question but it's a good point i i think he could have pushed harder a little bit uh but, but by that point his tires were virtually gone right because he he'd done so many laps on them eventually I think it would have been a bit hard for him to do more and of course you mentioned that the harder compound tires spend less time on his car than the mediums but there just isn't that much pace on there on that hards eventually yeah I, i guess it was just the 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 highest that the ferrari could finish today was the p6 that carlos sainz could get and mm. the mclaren was just seemingly quicker and you know after a point it's what lando norris did you know he was p3 at the start and then he realized that he needs to run his race and that's why he let 
Bottas and Perez do what you know that a faster you know a driver in a faster car would and should do to him, hmm. right? So it was just a case of then Carlos realizing that's it. I'm going to manage my pace, manage my race, and bring home these points because they are vital points in the championship. You know, go from P12 to P6 in a Ferrari that, that literally scored no points last weekend. He would take. He took that. He he grabbed those points with both hands. He really did. Held on to it quite well as well. Eventually, both signs and Leclerc. Stunning recovery drive. We just spoke about that a few minutes ago. But now for the next one. This is a fun one. Should Vettel have stayed out longer, considering what Carlos Sainz achieved by staying out longer? Now, I was really confused about this. I thought about this for a few moments. And then I asked Kunal this question. Within a minute, he crunched up the answer and came up with it so simply before we started recording. How? Uh, what, what was the answer, firstly, Kunal? Okay, great. So I'll tell you the answer and I'll tell you guys how you all can also find it because, you know, it's fairly easy. It's not rocket science, Come right? On. So uh, firstly, you know, Sebastian Vettel did just 27 laps on his mediums versus Carlos Sainz, who, like I said, did 41 laps on his medium, right? So the question that is asked is why couldn't Sebastian Vettel go as long as Carlos Sainz did and see if that strategy worked for him? The answer in this, you know, lies in two pop, two parts. That's where I checked data. First is checking Sebastian Vettel's lap times before he came into the pits. And now when Sommel and I did that, we actually found that Sebastian Vettel was in the 1 minute 11s all along. So there, we couldn't really see that there was a tire drop off that happened. You know, one of the reasons why teams could end up calling their drivers in the pits. So the second reason here was, did anyone racing around him? make a stop and that's where the answer lies so yuki sonoda made a stop and that prompted george Ru so first it was george then it was yuki and then for the fear of not being want to be undercut they called it sebastian fettel as well so his strategy was then dictated by the drivers around him and that's why in my assumption and I, you know an engineer from from the aston martin racing team could very well blow holes in this but just given the data that i have access to this is why Sebastian Vettel didn't end up doing a Carlos Sainz. Makes me wonder, what have I done to be sitting right here in a podcast like this and having access to this live? Crazy, crazy stuff. But hey, time for another question. Time for the final question of the day. Time for the final point to discuss for the day. A question by Devik, who actually was one of our top three finishers in last year's Grand Prix Prediction competition. Hey, you, my friend, if you have not predicted so far, check out the link in the description below. Lots of people are taking part. You can still win. Check that out down below in our social links. Now, favorite moment of our race. I think it's a good note to end on. We can save on all of our thoughts for next week in our preview that's going to come up on Thursday evening. But yes, Kunal, favorite moment from your race. Uh, for me, the favorite moment in the race was probably just seeing Charles Leclerc drive through and through yeah. all the possible cars. He literally overtook cars twice. And I was talking to Nitin and then we're going to write something like you know, something to this effect in the newsletter. But Charles probably made the most number of overtakes in the race because he literally overtook mm. drivers twice. So that was that. But he, there wasn't a moment where suddenly you're like, oh my God, that's it. That's my <laughs> favorite moment of the race. So I had to sort of cultivate one just because I knew you're probably going to ask me this question. And it shouldn't just be me in the hot seat, Samuel. So what was your favorite moment of the race? Can I be very honest? When it ended, I, I was having a hard time. <laughs> I was having a really hard time watching this one. Yeah, probably because it was going to be a very long day later on. And I could get an hour's worth of rest later. But seriously, it was a hard race to watch. But hey, good results, good stuff, good data for us to analyze. I just saw there and watched the data being analyzed. So there's that. But amazing race weekend all around in terms of understanding what it's like for the championship. And we shall be back on Thursday. So keep checking the Inside Line F1 podcast and Pitch the Podium. That's enough from us today. See you then, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And see you in a few days. Bye-bye. Thank you, Samil. And see you guys. Bye-bye.